coming. My name is Eric Marks. I'm on the MPSC Board of Directors. Uh, first, some MPSC announcements. The fall edition of our magazine, MPSC Wavelength, is in members' mailboxes and is also available online. There's tons of great content in this issue, and you can also read the full magazine at mpsc.org. At the MPSC store, you'll find all sorts of apparel, such as mugs, water bottles, stationery, tote bags, and beach towels. Head to mpsc.org slash store to see what, uh, which clothes and accessories best suit your style. On our MPSC YouTube channel, you'll find lots of great sound advice events from the past few years. Head there to learn more from the sound teams behind Mr. Robot, Better Call Saul, Metal Gear Solid, Halo Infinite, and much more. And thank you for coming to uh, today's very special MPSC Sound Advice and Foley Roundtable event. I'd like to introduce your host for today's event, MPSC board member, Miguel Arujo. Miguel, please take it away. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to just discuss the format for the event. We'll be devoting the first hour or so to a planned discussion with the final 30 minutes opening up to your questions for you attending uh, tonight. Throughout the event, please keep your mics muted uh, and your cameras off. You can voice your questions through the, any time in the Zoom chat throughout the event. We will leave those till the questionnaire section at the end, sorry, the Q&A at the end of the event. Uh, I will be following those in the chat though as we go. Uh, so please feel free to keep adding those along the way. Uh, I'll do my best uh, to get through all the questions, but if we don't, we will try to combine those that seem to be uh, joining together. All right. In the 1980s, uh, the 1980s were a time filled with wonder and excitement at the movies. No one knew this better than Steven Spielberg, who began the 80s with two mega hits in Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. In 1985, he produced another all-time classic, Back to the Future, directed by Robert Zemeckis. The film was a giant hit with audiences and critic alike, and went on to win one Academy Award for Best Sound Effects Editing. The two supervising sound editors of the film were Chuck Campbell and Bob Rutledge. Back to the Future is bustling with timeless, unforgettable moments that are ingrained in all of us. The DeLorean speeding towards 88 miles per hour. Doc hanging from the clock tower as he tries to reconnect cables. Marty riding through town on his skateboard. Biff bullying just about everybody. And Marty's hand disappearing while on stage at the Enchantment Under the Sea dance. I've met so many people who not only think this was the best movie of the 1980s, but it's their absolute favorite film of all time. But while this movie opened our hearts and our imaginations, bringing it to life was far from a smooth and easy process. To help us learn about how it all came together, I'm honored to be joined by key members of the sound team. Sound editors Scott Hecker and Sam Crutcher, Foley artist John Roche and Ellen Hewer, and assistant ADR editor Glenn Morgan. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having us. I didn't have that response written down. <laughs> just, just follow the scripts in, come on. <laughs> I'll start with the question uh, directed at Scott and Sam. The supervising sound editors who accepted the Academy Award for Back to the Future were Chuck Campbell and Bob Rutledge. Sam and Scott, you both worked directly with them. Can you help paint a picture of, uh, for us who they were and how they approached sound editorial for this film? Scott, take it away. Take the first stab at it, will you? Yeah. Um, originally, uh, this film, uh, you know, by Bob Zemeckis, uh, that was Chuck's client. And uh, Chuck was ready to jump in and do it right after Romancing the Stone. Or um, no, it was, was that, it was right after that, right? Or, I believe no? so. Yeah. Yes. Used anyway, Cars was before that. Yeah, then all of a sudden, I guess uh, Universal just accelerated the release date. And I believe uh, the last day of principal photography was like April 26th of 85. And two months later, literally two months later, they had an answer print. And after that answer print, uh, the movie was in theaters 10 days later on July 3rd. Um, so with that, uh, Chuck and Bob had been uh, working um together sometimes we would do episodes of tj hooker if, if chuck got you know too busy um he would have us help him out so we had a good relationship with chuck and uh so obviously when you know 
the, the push was on and the pressure was on, Chuck looked to Bob to, uh, you know, take, take, uh, take some of the weight off and uh, contribute. So they uh, shared credit on this and divvied the show up um, by responsibility. Um, I just always knew Chuck, you know, as a young, you know, up and coming sound editor, he was the classiest guy, you know, the ultimate diplomat of sound editors, if there ever was one, because we were a motley bunch, but Chuck, <laughs> Chuck was just super cool and super classy, cool as a cucumber, always just a wonderful gentleman and super creative. And uh, it was a pleasure working with him. And uh, so me being with Bob, um, I'd been with Bob since 77 when I started. And um, so it was myself and uh, John Larson, Harry Miller. Um, I think that's about it from Blue Light. Dave Arnold was our assistant. Um, and so we were responsible basically for um, the DeLorean, the um, uh, sort of, I think a lot of people chipped in on the last uh, clock tower scene, but I remember we did a lot of work on that as well. And I'm, I'm sure Sam, you can chime in. I think, I think it was a mambo combo shared, shared experience. It was such a, a busy sequence and whatnot, but um, between the flux capacitor and all of the DeLorean stuff, uh, that's what our focus was uh, at Blue Light. And um, so, yeah, that, that's pretty much uh, the scenario. Well, as you, as you said, Chuck Campbell was a uh, was a incredible gentleman, very gracious, uh, generous. Uh, he had quite the stable of clients. Uh, he had not only Robert Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg, but Richard Donner and uh, John Landis, among many other luminaries of that time period. Uh, I worked for Chuck and his uh, company about ten years, and never had a weekend off. Barely had a weekend off because he was always so busy. And the larger the film, the more compacted it was because they're always making changes and that accordion never moves. The release date is always solid and they're always making changes down to the last minute, which you talked about, you know, with only two months to get the film done and to answer print in theaters. Um, Chuck uh, was a man who believed everything revolved around Foley. Uh, and John was his main guy for many years. I'm sure you'll hear from John about that. But uh, he would personally go to the Foley stages and, and uh, supervise every footstep, every sound, every drop, every whatever it was. Uh, we had a lot of editors on that crew. Chuck's company, uh, Hollywood, um, Way. Way. Hollywood Way Inc. was himself, Lou Adam, Lou Adaman, Rick Franklin, and Dave Pettyjohn. I had the good fortune um, to be one of the first editors always hired and one of the last to go. So I got to work on a lot of films with Chuck. And... Uh, Back in those days, you know, we didn't have region bins to select from. We didn't have the ability to see and hear everything all at once on a playback as we do now uh, on Pro Tools. And uh, so Chuck would personally pick every sound effect that came to you often, or sometimes if you felt you needed something more, he'd grab it and get it uh, reprinted in the uh, uh, in the sound shop, uh, which he had right there on premises with uh, Howard Nyman and Mel Nyman. Uh, well, Mel Nyman originally, and then Howard Nyman and uh, you'd get what you needed. Uh, I remember working on that clock tower scene with the lightning and it wasn't just lightning strikes, you know, we had all sorts of things to pick from cannon fire, gunshots, rifle shots, explosions. Now they weren't the main part of it, but they all added the uh, total, uh, to the total package of what you ended up hearing. Um, typically, uh, you know, one effect wouldn't do. You had to layer it and make it uh, uh, a larger than life, of course, as we do with movies anyways, you know, you never hear a realistic gunshot. It's always a, a, a compendium of different things that make it uh, have more impact and dramatic uh, augmentation. But uh, Chuck, um, I wanted to make sure and talk about Chuck and, and, and I could tell many stories about his fatherly ways, his uh, gregariousness, his humor, his uh, ability to get people to perform beyond maybe their natural capabilities, because whatever he asked for, you wanted to give him, and we all gave our all. We had a very large crew by the end of this picture, I think some 15 or 16 editors in-house uh, because of all the changes. There'd be one person just running down dupes making changes. Those are black and white copies of the picture, and every editor had a dupe, and every dupe had to be changed. 
um, you know, whether it was one frame or changing sequences or scenes. So um, I, Glenn, help me out here. Maybe you remember, Scott, who was our main assistant? Was it Kim Morell? Kim Nolan, I mean, at that time? I don't remember. I just know at Blue Light, it was Dave Arnold, but right. I don't know I, over at Chuck's place. I'll try and look that up, but I, I meant to do that earlier. But uh, also back in the day, um, you know, Chuck Neely cut all the foley that Chuck shot, but we cut the rest of the reel. And often we would go to the stage with the reel as a sound editor to see it pre-dubbed. That's the way it was back in the days when we did it on film to make sure that it was covered, uh, to learn, to see, to absorb, to understand what worked with other effects and how they played off of each other. So Chuck was very gracious that way that he always brought the editor of that reel to the stage as it pre-dubbed so that you could experience that, have that in your back pocket and know what things were working for you and what you maybe needed to change. Because I said, as I said, you didn't get to hear all the sound effects together. You hung it on a pin and went to went to the next roll and played it and grease marked it and set it in against the dupe and forward you went and you said, okay, that's all right. You hung that on a pin and then it got built by the assistants into individual 1,000 or 900 foot reels of leader film. Um, yeah. It was a pleasure to work with Chuck for over 10 years on many films. He won three Academy Awards for sound editing, E.T., Back to the Future, and Who Framed Red Roger Rabbit. That's all I got for now. Perfect. Uh, John Allen, how about from your side uh, with the, such a tight production or post-production schedule? How did that affect you, and did you have to do anything differently to how you usually work uh, to get things out the door on time? Yeah, I'll just go real quick. Yeah, <clears throat> quickly, um, rowing back to Chuck. He was so elegant. He lived on Tuxedo Terrace. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, he was an actor, by the way. So the reason why I mention that is on the Foley stage, then he could talk to Ellen and myself and really help direct us. To answer the question specifically, it didn't really impact us per se because um, you know, he knew what was coming down the pike pretty much, he, Chuck. And um, we were at a facility called Tosh Soundworks where we needed to actually do telecine, which was unusual during that time. Most of the time we worked with the dupes, black and white. Whereas we worked with, um, uh, you know, videotape, uh, believe it or not, half inch Betamax. So, so it did not really affect us as far as the schedule goes. It just was get in, start, go, and don't stop. Would that, does that sound about right, Ellen? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and yeah. and uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to wait for my turn. Are you finished? <laughs> I just wanted to say also about Chuck. He was so, so sensitive and aware and evolved in the way he treated us. I remember when we did Schindler's List. John, he, do you remember he had a screening for us at his house because he was concerned that we might be upset by the imagery. That's the kind of man he was. And he, um, he knew I wanted to be an actor too and had me do for the Back to the Future 2 when Marty ends up in the wrong house and in bed with the little black girl, she's screaming bloody murder. And he let me do the... Uh, the screens for her, of which I still get residual checks today, to this wow. day. And um, I, I, it's hard for me to talk about him still because, you know, he touched all of our lives in such a deep way. Yeah, he um, really, he really did, didn't he? And uh, yeah, and it was, it was a pleasure to work with him. I think hopefully that answered your question, Miguel. That's perfect. Thank you so much. One thing I forgot to mention, and you mentioned he how elegant he is, was his voice. Yeah. Melodious, yeah. dulcet tones. He had a great deep bass or baritone voice. I don't know. Yeah. Mentioning, I thought. Doesn't give me confidence cutting back to my high-pitched voice right now. Ha! <laughs> uh, the next question I have for you, I know the, sh the film is, you know, 30 odd years uh, in, in the past. Do you have any recollection of uh, 
the creative direction Robert Zemeckis and co-writer Bob Gale gave you and your departments uh, prior to starting on this film? And I'll let any one of you jump in with that. Yeah, that was something that Chuck and Robert yeah. were, were privy to, and they would dis disseminate it to us by giving us what we needed to interpret the scene with what effects they gave us. So we were never a part of that discussion. We would have conversations about what's going on and and how Robert wanted it, Zemeckis or Bob Gale, but uh, it, it wasn't given to us directly. And truth, right. be told, truth be told, the schedule was so intense. I mean, those guys were so incredibly busy just trying to get the picture cut. I don't remember like a lot of specific direction. I think, I think just with the history between Chuck and and Bob Zemeckis, and uh, and the relationship between Bob Rutledge and Chuck, it was um, as through osmosis, man. It was everyone just had to go. I remember typically Bob, um, like Chuck, would cue um, every bit of action. He'd give you a footage, describe the action, and he would physically supply you with a kit of sounds that you should listen to and try to use for that event. And I just remember on this, there was like not a lot of time for that. Everyone as editors sort of had to, based on their responsibility, go to the library and start listening to stuff and putting in orders um, for sound effects reprints. Um, you know, back then, you know, nothing was instant access, random access like it is now, looking into a library, clicking on a sound, popping it into your Pro Tools session. I mean, you had to go to the master sound effects library and find the specific sounds that you wanted and listen to them, choose them, and actually make out a transfer order and mount each sin single sound together on a sound roll to where the wow. transfer department uh, would transfer all these sounds. And then the assistant would have to take time to break them all down for you and provide them to you uh, in a sound effects kit. And then you could commence editing. So it was quite a process to um, actually get a sound effect in your hand to edit. So I just remember at Blue Light, uh, you know, the four of us, um, Bob Rutledge and, and John Larson and Harry Miller, myself, uh, I remember we were all scrambling through the library books. Let me use the books now. Okay, I'm done with them for right now. And then running up to the sound effects library, pulling masters, listening to stuff, putting our orders in. Um, it was a mad scramble. And as far as the um, the DeLorean, um, part of that stuff we got actually from um, Romancing the Stone, the little mule that was used in, in that film. So that the little was, mule being the Jeep? Yeah, that, that right. souped up Ford Bronco. Right. Um, yeah, also, that, Scott, I just wanna make sure that you mention, or I'll mention it for you, that the masters you're talking about were 35 millimeter, no VHS, no DAT, no no other kind of media. 35 millimeter mag, yep, right. yep, yep. One at so, a time. Yeah, and if we wanted to change uh, the nature of a sound, we would have to do that in our transfer department. Like if we wanted a certain sound effect slowed down or sped up, we would have to delineate to the transfer person, this, this particular sound, I want sped up 10%, 25%, or slow down accordingly. Um, sometimes we uh, had a VSO machine, a you know, very speed oscillator to where we could uh, very speed the pitch of certain sounds, but it was very arduous process. But I mean, back then when you were doing it, you didn't think anything of it because there was no other way to do that. Um, so, um, yeah, just thinking about all the work. I mean, it's it's basically the difference between hand knitting a sweater and using a sewing machine to to make a sweater. Um, but anyway, that was part of the the process is the hands on uh, all of us going into the library and just trying to find all the different sounds. And that was unusual for us to work that way because like Sam and I just said, uh, usually Bob and Chuck being the consummate supervisors that they were, were, would always cue every bit of action in each reel and pull the appropriate sounds for you to use. Um, and in this case, some of that got done. I remember Bob pulling some sounds, but he, there's no way he couldn't have had the time to pull all the different sounds that 
Well, also, Scott, the there were many shots that weren't there in the original form that we got the original dupes. Uh, a lot of the DeLorean stuff, the time transfer sequence and all that came later after it was being treated through special effects. And back then it was almost, you know, pre uh, uh you know, it's archaic compared to today, but it took sometimes days or a week to get a shot. Yeah, you know, I remember and, ILM. Uh, ILM was going just crazy trying to get all the visual effects done for sure. Industrial light and magic. Yes, yes, right. yes. And it was um, created for Star Wars, by the way. That's right. Yeah. And um, yeah, so yeah, it was, it was an incredible process. And you know, what's weird is I, I remember cutting, I mean, just madly editing and creating sounds, but I don't remember a boatload of changes. And maybe it Maybe it's just because I think at that point, I think they had sort of tried to lock off on the cut, but the only thing throwing the um, changes in were visual effects changes and whatnot. And, um, you know, you, Sam, you mentioned um, sound editors going to the mixing stage to cover the reels that they cut. Um, and some part of that was for good reason too, because if you got on the stage, the sound supervisor was there, in this case, Chuck and or Bob, um, but, if you, they were mixing your material and an issue came up, they weren't familiar, you know, necessarily with what you did. So it's like if they requested a change or needed something updated or made better or altered in any way, you were the one familiar with that reel and that material. So you go into the change room and fix it. Um, and obviously with the stage being as, as expensive as it is and was, um, it was not a good agree. thing to be in the change room. That was downtime, basically, for the hey. downtime stage. <laughs> <laughs> it better you had, be to, good. You had better. to roll your dupe as, and the uh, and the unit as fast as possible without it slipping the uh, fill the uh, game, slipping and the synchronizer. It go. used to be that you had to take the uh, film dupe off the projector with whatever units you were going to work on. Then somebody got smart and bought an extra set of dupes for the change room, so you didn't have to unload the projector and reload it. This is right around that time too. Um, but you know what? Chuck loved the change room. He would often say, no, no, I'll handle it because he just loved to do things like that and keep his hands in it. Because for the most part, he listened to sound effects all the time, picking the kits like you were talking about. And then of course, when he was away or too busy, we had to do, as you say, listen to our own, you know, and find our, what we needed. But um, he, he didn't do any editing because he was the supervisor and he had to delegate. And it was his creative process and he would of course you know be the mastermind be behind the main effects and what he thought was important and uh you know you can get a, a five rolls of door closers and pick your own but as far as the lightning and i'm sure for the delorean for bob and other sound effects um you know there were certain effects that had to be used because this is what they want their vision as given to them by the director and and gail you know was so just from a um, Foley point of view, Chuck um, was always so open to the creative process. Like he never told us, even Roger Rabbit and whatever, all the things we did with him, John, he was, he was in it with us. He was part of, you know, the, the fun, let's see what we come up with kind of stuff. And I remember um, when the DeLorean in the first one went through a time period where it had to come back frozen. Um, he wanted to hear a special sound for when the door, the gull wings released. And John came up with this brilliant idea to get one of those old metal ice cube trays um, with the ice mm. frozen in it. And he would pull back that, I don't know, this is a glory cue for me. I loved that moment because I thought it was just so clever and it sounded like it was cold, you know? And um, he, so he pulls back that back and the sound is great. And I just thought it's interesting. I use that exact same prop to rip off the heads of people in Twilight in the series, <laughs> the vampire Twilight. And it worked beautifully. And I just think it's so interesting how a prop can be one thing to one visual and something entirely different to another. But I think, you know, Chuck just had a passion for the process, the creative process. Even Roger Rabbit, you know, Fluffy wasn't funny, so we used rubber. 
but it took a while to figure that out. And he was right there every step of the way, figuring it out with us, like a little kid. You know, he loved, cool. he loved it being there, and just helping us. And... Well, I, th I, th I think Ellen just, you know, jump onto that same thought. You know, we, would, uh, we were lucky we did that film uh, in order, if I recall correctly, reels one through whatever it was, which is, uh, you know, these days this can be unusual. And what we would do is we'd look at the reel with Chuck. Now it had been cued, you know, on the cue sheets came to us, we'd see, okay, and we'd do all the feet first, then go back, do all the props, and then do movement either at, at the end of that reel or possibly at the end of the show. Um, so when we looked at it once the first time through with Chuck, he would mention certain things and we make, you know, notes, mental notes or whatever on the cue sheets <clears throat> to, to, you know, find out, okay, what, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna do that? You know, kind of get the mental, juice falling in the head and uh you know and he did as ellen said he there was no filter you know because he what he would like is to see what you can do because if what we did could be a good addition or it could even be a standalone not that you know we it's not a matter of glory it's just you know what's going to help the picture and uh, he was very open to that which was wonderful because foley um to some degree had not a, the greatest uh, back in the 60s ish was just kind of, eh, there it is, push it up, uh, okay. You know, whereas getting into this era, it, it really kind of came into his own. So anyway, back to you, Miguel. <laughs> or, 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 no, or. That, that's perfect, thank you. Uh, we've heard a little bit about everyone's side of this uh, process of the film. I'd love to hear, Glenn, from your side. I imagine ADR couldn't have been any easier with the short time frame, trying to book talent, get everything cut in. Uh, and with all the changes, I'm sure there were different versions of things coming in. Well, I, I do want to kind of share in doing the words. I always learned dialogue in ADR is being referred to as the words. And uh, in doing the words, we kind of tr treated it a lot like sound effects in itself, especially with all the cut cutting back and forth and, and also aging the actors and having the actors reperform some of their lines in their, and as they jump back and forth in history. I do want to say that my experience in Back to the Future in the beginning was uh, a very lax interpretation of when I arrived. Uh, I was fortunate to work with another supervisor on that show, Larry Singer. He was our ADR supervisor. And Larry Singer is just a dream to work with. And Larry and Chuck, as with many of his collaborative um, people, they were good friends. They were, besides working well together, they were very good friends. And they understand the, uh, the challenges. And on this particular film, I will say to you, over my career, that was the first time I worked on a film that I never heard the word no. Art Rapola, the post supervisor, understood the, the dynamics of what was happening and the challenges. And so if we ever asked for anything and we explained to him why we needed it, it wasn't this long explanation. It was, okay, and we got it. And case in point, we had so much ADR on camera, off camera, futs, phone, back and forth, characters, this, that sometimes it's, there's so much going on, you can actually either forget or there's overlaps. And as Scott had mentioned, the last place you want to be on the stage to fix things, or last place you want to be is in the change room fixing things because it's so expensive by the hour. And, and taking that into mind, Larry called up Art Rapola and he said, look, it'd really be helpful for Bill Varney, who was the mixer, the head mixer, gaffer mixer for that show. If we were able to have a dub stage of our own and just let us pre-run our dialogue, our ADR, just to see that it's all blending back and, um, in and out. And he said, okay. So, you know, something like that is very unheard of just to get a stage to preview your work because as everyone has mentioned so far, there was no such thing as Pro Tools. You couldn't layer all this stuff in one area. We were limited to a moviola with one track. And so to have that luxury of sitting on the stage and being able to hear whether things were being clipped or cut off, it was a dream. It was a pleasure. Now, I was invited to be part of Back to the Future in November of 83 or 84. 
And it, Larry Singer had called and said, hey, hey, kid, kid, what are you doing in the spring? I got this little Spielberg film that you want to help me out on. And I now I'm tickled that he would call Back to the Future a little Spielberg film. But uh, when I arrived my first day, there was nothing to do except read the script. And even then, I had to read the script in the cutting room. I couldn't take it out in the lobby. I couldn't take it home. I had to read it there uh, in, in the cutting room. And we sat for a week before a scene, a scene came on a core this round. Uh, we had a dupe and we had uh, a track. And, and that was our, pardon? Guide track. Guide track. Guide track. And uh, which is a copy of the actual work track. So I, I, it didn't have any of the splices from different cuts, but we had a uh, EDL that told us where the cuts were. Anyway, we had a scene and we were thrilled. And then a few days later, I think four or five days later, we got another scene that we put together. Now we almost had a reel. And, and by the 10th day, we actually had a physical Goldberg of 900 feet of scenes. And that's how we progressed uh, working on the show. And I, I, I will tell you, it was, it was fun. Everyone was collaborative. Um, most people don't know this, but that was a collaborative thing with Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale. Uh, both of them had written Back to the Future. They tried at least 30, 40 times to sell that movie. No one bit, but it was very special to them. And a lot of times during the ADR sessions, Bob Gale would be there with Bob Zanekis and they would have these little, little meetings off to the side. Does this work? How does that work? And the one thing that was prevalent through all of this was how well people worked together. Chuck Campbell would talk to Bob Rutledge. Bob Zemeckis would talk to them. Bob Gale would talk. I mean, and then we would talk to Larry Singer. It, it was, it, it's the way movies should be done. And the fact that the post-production schedule was so compressed uh you would think it would be chaos but it was controlled chaos uh and and uh, what was the last thing i want oh what i remember is we had a rap party at universal on a wednesday they shot inserts with michael j fox on a tuesday they had to leave the party to go look at answer prints because on that Friday, the movie was being released. Now, throughout this whole process, I received these PR pins, Back to the Future, August. And then, or actually, it was September 19th. And then it was, and then a, a, a while back, after some of the previews, when it, it skyrocketed, they moved it up and it came, and it was September. And then they had another screening, I don't know who that was for, but that's when it got moved up to July. And so, so you could see how he, the, the, the greatness of that movie, was, they were, Universal was just such in a hurry to take advantage of the summer that they kept pushing the schedule that was already tight, even tighter. And, and uh, that, to me, it was, it, it was a great experience. Go ahead, questions? Uh, I just want to, I don't know the age group of those watching on live stream or here on uh, Zoom, but um, back in the day, <laughs> back in the mid 80s sound crews this was unusual for a for a, a sound supervisor like chuck to farm out part of it like he did bob and he were good friends but we had an adr supervisor and we had a guy who cut all the foley but most crews in town when you were given a reel you cut all the sound effects all the backgrounds all the dialogue all the uh adr and all the foley and that is what you were responsible for. That was an outgrowth of the way the industry developed in the 50s with, with oxide tape, you know, after they were cutting uh, uh, cutting with scissors and splicing blocks. What, do you, what, did, what was that called back in the 50s, uh, Scott? The, uh, the waveforms on... Um, optical. Yeah, optical. Optical, yeah. It was yeah. cut on optical in the early 50s until they came up with oxide on tape. And uh, that was the way it was done until somewhere in the 90s it started getting compartmentalized into only ADR people, only Foley people, only sound effects people, only sound design people. But we did all of that. And uh, Chuck, of course, and Bob, very instrumental in creating the sound design 
portions, primarily, you know, the uh, the lightning strikes, the DeLorean, the uh, the amp exploding, that kind of stuff you didn't find in a library and you didn't have Pro Tools or any kind of, you know, other than the VSO Scott mentioned, or maybe taking a bunch of effects to a, uh, a dub stage and having the mixers put them through some of their uh, uh, um, uh, components that they have on the stage, you know, notch filters, et cetera. And it wasn't very, you know, compared to today, it was rather archaic and ancient, but we did what we had to do and we did the best we could with all that. Yeah, I think there was a, a cool advantage to uh, being a sound editor and being responsible for all facets of a reel. You were giving a reel, as you said, Sam. Um, I think it was really good because as you were cutting the dialogue first, you were noting like what what production sounds were really good. And so when you went to cut your sound effects and the full and cue the foley for what was needed, you really had a, a really intimate knowledge of what was good. It wasn't just foley editors, sound effects editors, and dialogue editors just all working separately on their own islands, but you were the, the person responsible for all facets of the reel. So it was really efficient in that way as far as, well, I don't need to cover that with sound effects. The production was good, and I know we're going to do Foley to top that. Or conversely, it's like, no, we don't even need Foley for that because it's so great in production and no one's talking. We can save that for the foreign. Um, and um, and working on film, I, I think it was really good. You had to know how the different sounds that you were putting together were going to sound in your right. head you're listening to each sound as you cut it and you know that, okay, I've got a high end element and now I need a mid range element. And now I need a low frequency element. And you, you were sort of forced to imagine how these sounds were gonna play together. You didn't have the luxury of actually hearing them all play together. You could drag them through a triple head synchronizer and wheel through it and sort of get, get an idea of how these three sounds were gonna sound together, but it was pretty, pretty rough. But um, Anyway, it was really, I'm glad I, I started on film and, and got the best of both worlds with the technology now. I mean, you know, having just revisited watching Back to the Future after a couple decades, I hadn't seen it. Um, boy, we've come a long way because as creative and fun as the sound job on Back to the Future is, parts of it was like, whoa, back in the day, that was like excellence. And now it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I think that every time I see Bullet. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> now that we've done a bit of a, a general on everything, I'd like to jump into some specifics. Uh, the opening shot of the film is one of a very long tracking shot through Doc's lab with lots of clocks, futuristic can openers, knobs, a coffee maker, a, ver a very minimal dialogue. Clearly Doc's fascination with the time manipulation helps set up this world right away. It seemed like we were in a mad scientist lab version of Geppetto's house. How did each of you approach establishing the world in this opening scene of the film? Well, I'll take good. that first if that's all right, guys. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Tom. Well, Foley, to some degree, is see a dog, hear a dog. So, you know, again, running that scene with Chuck, Ellen and I would look at it and go, okay, we have all these clocks and these uh, cat clocks with eyes moving, you know, the toaster going nuts the coffee maker missing the mug etc so basically we just set up and did each of those props um a couple things though the um the mechanical arm can opener and then feeding of uh, einstein that motor that you hear there was part of what we call the delorean door ed bannon who was the head tech of taj soundworks he uh, mounted a, a door uh, with an electric window um and a battery that you could, you know, hit the switch, up it go, down it go. And so we recorded that and then put it into a, a MIDI device back then, you know, antique compared to today with Tim Sadler. And the Tim Sadler was the mixer there, my partner, and he was from the music recording business previous. So he really knew a lot of tricks and things that to some degree, in the, at least in the Foley area arena, it was not... Uh, common knowledge or not practiced a lot so point being we took that so then you know you've got that motor there and then uh, we're basically changing the pitch you know by today's standards like oh boy but back then it was really exciting and uh, 
So we just kind of filled it in. Then we hit the, okay, the key is inserted and the switches are flicked. And all of a sudden we hear this amplifier hum. There again, uh, and Ellen was next to me along with Tim. Tim set up this device, which the, was just a hum. Wah, 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 wah. And he basically put it uh, not on a fader per se, something along with Ed was a rotary dial. So we just, all I, had, all I do is like watch this picture and go, whoa, 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 you know, and just that's how we got to that. Um, and uh, something that Sam might not know, uh, Ed Bannon did actually explode a speaker for that film. <laughs> really? Yes, he did. I did uh, not know that. Yes, he for, did. For the amp? Yeah, yes. When, when, I mean, because we see Marty, you know, pull back with the pick, you know, gleaming and all of a sudden, right? That was a lot of effects too. I'm not trying to say it wasn't effects, no, but of I'm, course. Yeah. So, uh, and that was kind of one of the wonderful uniqueness of it. Because again, we, we fully can only do what we see, you know, or sometimes we're asked to do things off stage, like build a cabinet off stage, but that's an inside joke. Anyway, <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's the one thing about, you know, Zemeckis. And Spielberg, et cetera, those directors, producers, et cetera, that really have a vision, you know, you immediately got engaged in the picture, like, wow, this is, this is a whole world. And last but not least, uh, which we might touch on later too, of course, he's coming in on a skateboard. On a Foley stage, how long is the run that you can run a skateboard? Well, it's not gonna be that long. So scratch your head, Ed said, hey, why don't we just build something where you have uh, three trucks, you know, in a circle, so to speak. So basically you put something down like a lazy Susan. And that's how uh, the skateboard was born. Does that sound about right, Ellen? Yeah, I, I thought you had invented that process of continuous skating, which was, you know, I feel like just working at Taj and working under conditions like that with so many highly creative people collaborating was now in retrospect, I see how amazing that time period was you know, we kind of take it for granted after 40 years and <laughs> 300 films later, you don't realize it. I didn't until I started researching and kind of trying to jog my memory, how amazing of an opportunity that was. Like that doesn't exist anymore. Supervisors don't sit on the stage. They don't guide you. They don't, they're not a part of it. It's just, you know, we just do it. And, uh, it's changed so much, but I miss the collaboration and, you know, coming up with things that we have no idea what we're going to do. And then something happens and you're like, oh yeah, metal ice cube tray. I'll just do this. <laughs> like, what'd you do? Wake up one night? And it's called leave. intuition. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a great opportunity to um, recall and appreciate the craft you know agree you know we're agreed good stuff so Absolutely. there are 30, know. there's 31 people listed on the sound credits on imb uh imbd and uh among the other sound editors were larry carroll janice hampton uh of course scott myself uh john larson he was mentioned uh harry miller Chuck Neely, um, Alan Neinberg, Sonny Pettyjohn was an assistant. Uh, also, uh, Larry Fallick was an assistant. Bruce Richardson, Rod Rogers was an ADR assistant. And so I just thought it'd be nice. And um, B. Tennyson, Sebastian, Bill Varney, and William Sherrill, was it? Thurwell. Sh Bob Thur Thurwell, that's Thurwell. 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 We're the mixers. Thurwell. Yeah. Mixer. We were the mixers. And uh, Fred, and J Fred Stafford and Jerry Stanford. Stanford. So that was, there were a lot of people involved to get this done in that short period of time. I just thought they deserved mention. Absolutely. And yep. uh, I, I noticed on the IMDB that Gary Hecker has a, an uncredited. Uh, um, yeah, you know. And there, he's also in the audience. Yeah, and also there there was a sheet, uh, an ad in the variety right when, uh, right before the film was put out and it listed everywhere. I sent it to John and a couple other people. And um, yeah, there was quite a few other people, you know, that I didn't remember, but it took a village. Um, Do you so, have that picture, Miguel? Could you post that? Did I can, uh, I can, Eric give it to you? Scott Poss said I could uh, post that. Uh, Would you mind? Let's put see. it in the chat. Um, I'm not sure how I can do that. 
Um, drag, drag and drop, baby. Well, Scott can put it in the chat, but Miguel would have to post it. Don't have it immediately okay. available. Um, right. um, but sorry about that. But right. yeah, anyway, there was, yeah, I was I was shocked, and and obviously John and Ellen would know, but um, I was surprised I saw Kevin Bartnoff, Robin Harlan, Gary, Dan O'Connell, Joan Rowe. I don't know. Isabella. I think Joe Isabella didn't he work on it some too. Joey Ippolito? Uh, so Bella. No, he might have L. He might have L. It was uh it, it was just really dependent. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is a it was crazy. It was a list in the variety. Apparently, they just listed everyone that was on the um back to the future payrolls, people that had been paid to work on it. Uh no, no matter if they worked on it, I guess a day or two or whatever. Um, everyone seemed to get uh credit on in that variety ad on that day. So that was cool. Exactly. Even if you didn't get screen credit. And I just, you know, this is something else that you don't see anymore. Glenn has a background picture of a giant blow up of the back of his uh, cast and crew jacket. Somebody else who showed their, what, did you show your coat earlier? Scott. You still yeah, have it, Scott? Yeah. We, back, back, when I say back in the day in the 80s, we always got stuff at the end of the wrap parties. We got hats, we got coats, we got uh backpacks we got all sorts of stuff and that was a windbreaker they gave us at the end of the show yeah that was awesome and the wrap party at that chinese restaurant up near universal studios was a gas that was really really a nice release after everyone had been just jamming for that long um, to get right it. and they were very very gracious to us bob zemeckis and um spielberg all all the filmmakers bob gale Everyone was really just so, so appreciative. Who was the picture editor? I do not recall. Was Art, Artie Smith was the, um, Art Smith. the main, but then there was Harry. I think he's listed in that too. Harry's. I'm going to look right now. Harry. Oh. Uh, Arthur Schmidt, Harry Karamatis. Harry, uh, there you go. Yeah. Harry, I think, was the second editor on that with uh, Artie Schmidt believe what I have screen shared is the image we were just talking about. Okay. A little fun fact. Uh, while we're having a look at that, actually, John and Ellen, I had something that I would love to follow up on with you. Uh, you talked a bit about the skateboard and how it, you know, has to sound longer than it can go. But besides just the, the actual length of it, you know, the skateboard is such a fun element that Marty connects with his character. Is there something more to the skateboard sound that you guys played around with to help tell that part of the story and connect it to him? Well, the unfortunate answer is no. <laughs> you know, we basically it was just the, uh, we had an actual skateboard for Marty putting his feet on it. You know, at times he hit it and flip it up and catch it or whatever, or put it down or it hit the plutonium, you know, box uh, at the opening scene. So those were, you know, we used the practical, uh, skateboard but for the actual rolling no that was just uh, again think of it as kind of a glorified lazy susan and uh and yeah so that, that's that, that's right right now right it was um, great i know john my first film i did was skate town usa with dan at burbank editorial or director sound i forget what it was called but they're like we found out our projections since how to roller skate come come in and you know we were just trying to like look at the screen and then we literally roller skating around trying to figure out wasn't happening so we ended up with dan would release a skate and then i would release a, another one like just like singing in the round row 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 your boat but it took us forever like it didn't occur to them to go to a rink and just record some wild stuff they didn't want to do it that way so when you came up with that idea I was just so, I mean, it was years later that I did Back to the Future with you, like many years later. And I, I was like, oh, could have had a V8, you know, it's the <laughs> moment. <laughs> Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> it was just, you know, things like that that seem so simple, but are really pretty extraordinary. Like after a while, you just develop this part of your brain that starts to think like a Foley artist and you're creating something out of nothing and that whole process is so exciting because it's so in the moment and it's so alive and it's moments like that that make this job you know continually still you know fun to be a part of 
So there you well, have it. Hey, absolutely. I feel equally, you know, grateful that I got to work with you for seven years and, you know, do all the stuff we did. <laughs> me too. If, if memory serves me correctly, in that skateboarding apparatus, I also believe you built the handle on it so you could do the jumps and the lands and still keep it continuous. Is correct? Uh, well, we, we actually had two, well, two things. For the actual, um, let's call it the Lazy Susan skateboard, I had a little peg come up that could turn and you couldn't hear it. So I could just, you know, play like a think, think of a steering wheel with one of those little right. arms. Uh, that, but of course, then the coming up or down, uh, impacting, et cetera, that was done with the practical um, skateboard. And, or we actually had more than one, depending yeah, on. No, I that. thought you had like two or three different yeah. skateboards. It was, it was going to be yeah. heavy, it's going to be light, you know, just that type of thing. So, yeah. Apparently, the, it took them three weeks to just shoot like a small section. It was really difficult because they had to set wow. them up on, you know, different angles and green screen and all it was really elaborate that whole thing but didn't you do john didn't you do a sound for the hoverboard like well, there's a well, okay uh, really quick and that's in back to the future too um <laughs> uh anyway. that, that and just that was the one effect out of probably three for chuck campbell that i never really nailed <laughs> because uh it was a sound that we came, kind of came up with, but it wasn't really right. He took it and manipulated it uh, later on to give it more of a whoa, 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 whoa sound. And that worked great. So, but, you know, that's yeah, them all. <laughs> <laughs> so the, is that about right, Miguel? That's perfect. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, Glenn, you mentioned a bit earlier uh, about the process of having a stage to be able to check on the ADR process coming along as it was mixed in. Uh, and you also did mention there's a ton of phone calls and devices that voices go through uh, throughout this film. What was the process uh, through that? Was it literally capturing the material clean and sending it to the stage to be futzed? Or were you guys doing any sort of work on that in the editorial side? Well, no, we didn't do the futzing as much as we would create separate tracks just for the futzing. But we had to make sure that, that the cross-cutting would be seamless and not not choppy, not bumpy, not clippy. You know, it's sometimes, well, not sometimes, but a lot of our job is to make you think you're hearing what you're thinking. And if you don't have any imperfections in it, then you then then you've succeeded in in giving that giving the audience that perception. Uh, as for uh, scheduling ADR, it was a challenge with. Uh, uh, the cast always shooting and us having that compressed schedule and working around when they were available. Uh, we were fortunate that a lot of the interiors were shot on the Universal lot and we were able to do the ADR with Alan Hawley downstairs, which a lot of times it was within 50 yards from the set to the ADR stage to, to shoot that ADR. And then there'd be times we would go through and for whatever reason, whether it be the wind with Doc or Doc Brown or whether it be outside in the bar. I mean, there, are, there were things that come up that, that since we would have the opportunity that we would actually shoot some ADR. But uh, I would say the recording of the, of the dialogue was pretty good to begin with. It was just more of story content and, and uh, locate story content and storytelling to make sure that the story is complicated in itself to keep it simple um yeah it, i mean it's it's nothing cr any more crazy than it is today except we just had less time yeah it's, it's also really interesting where uh you know, you have to be so careful with those crossover points from your futzes that we take for granted these days going, oh yeah, just move the fade one frame left or right in a second and we fixed our problem. <laughs> well, have you been able to post that ad from Variety yet? Yes, it's in the chat uh, of the Zoom Can't chat. you post it on the screen? Do, I can do a share screen over here. Yeah, why don't you yeah, do a share, do a share screen? screen? There you go. We'll while, you're doing that, while you're doing that, a shout out to one of the sound editors who's in the crowd, Harry Miller. 
Yeah, Harry. I think we'll put, we'll put it up on the Foley Artist page, too, later. All right. Uh, I have another question here for Scott specifically. Uh, right before we see the DeLorean revealed for the first time, Marty gets to the mall parking lot and hears something that cues his attention. It's the sound of the car inside of a giant truck, and the truck door then opens up to reveal it. What were you hoping to communicate about the DeLorean before we actually get to see it? Well, you hear the true nature of the power of it for sure, because um, like I said earlier, the source of those sounds primarily were um, from the Little Mule, which is a souped up Ford Bronco. I think it was recorded in 1982, but it's a real beefy, muscular uh, sound. And so the sound that gets Marty's attention is a huge just engine rev. And, uh, and that sort of just lights off that whole sequence when uh, out of the car, we see the first time that we see the DeLorean. Um, so yeah, it was just, you know, that's, that's how dramatic a big engine rev off of a beat, beefy vehicle uh, can do the job. Awesome. Uh, sticking with the DeLorean for a second, uh, inside it, there's the all important flux capacitor. What was your <laughs> approach to creating the sound of this? Um, I remember faintly, I remember Bob initially pulled some sounds and then I worked on that as well. But, you know, in, in when you see something that wild, you could sort of see the coursing of the electricity coursing through the flux capacitor visually. And so we wanted to come up with a, a cool, um, a vibrant electronic sound that sounded like it was moving and coursing. And so, you know, you just go to the library books and we started just searching for different types of electric currents, um, electric pulse, and it was all based on search words, just like any sound effects search is. And uh, so we came up with uh, a good selection of different sounds for that. Um, and then during the course of the film, the flux capacitor um, performs various functions um, with which we just supplemented different beeps and boops and um, just weird electronic uh, quirky electronic sounds and I, I just remember um, just trying to go through and listen to the library and just to find the most unusual ones um, just to give it the most personality but yeah there's a good good fair of uh, standard beeps and boops and twirl electronic twirls and things like that but we just wanted to give it a, a good colorful personality um, unto itself and and I think throughout the film you sort of get that that feel that sort of like got its own little rhythm to itself. Very cool. Uh, Sam, this one's for you. I uh, did see you stand up. Oh, you're sitting down again. Perfect. Uh, when Einstein, Einstein, the dog, first time travels in the DeLorean, all we're left with as evidence is those fiery tire tracks. The fire continues for quite a bit as Doc and Marty talk about what just happened. Did you add any special flair to these fiery sounds to make them sound unique? I wish I could help you with that, but I didn't cut any of those. I think yeah. that was part of the DeLorean crew. Yeah, I, yeah, it, actually, it, that, Scott. Yeah, yeah, actually, that was my first assignment on the film because... Um, I answered it right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, initially, Bob wanted to focus on the engine sounds for the DeLorean. And um, so he, um, and then John Larson and Harry Miller help Bob flesh out the DeLorean. There was just so much of that throughout the film. Um, but Bob said, why don't you work on just exclusively, just to get going, you do all, all passing through the time barrier and uh, come up with, with that sound. And, um, and so pretty much any time, once we had established the sound, it was pretty much a, a peat and repeat of those same elements. But it was fun coming up with, you know, the different, um, there was a lot of like electric arcing sounds and lightning and thunder. And, uh, you know, I did the typical search of whooshes um, to go along with the electrical and uh, lightning sounds as well. And uh, the big flashes. And um, I believe we did record um, at blue light, uh, the sound of taking a plastic hefty trash bag and lighting it on fire. And it gives you a really cool zippy, like very that's unusual very cool. sound. And uh, that that's part, that's one of the, the sounds that's in there. 
um, as it passes through the time barrier as well. With the residual, um, sort of the flames licking, like you said, um, we had sort of like some flamethrower effects and different fire effects that were uh, laced in there. And yeah, for the life of me, it being 37 years ago, it's funny because a lot of this is just starting to come back to me. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that it was just a layering of those, those various electric arcing, lightning, thunder, whooshes, the sound of the zipping, uh, burning uh, plastic sound, and then uh, different um, residual fire effects uh, as a natural trail off at the end of the event to uh, give it a little pizzazz. I'm so glad I handed that question off to you, Scott. <laughs> yeah, that, that was fun. It was a good, good start for me on the film um, since you know it was sort of a standalone event. And uh, then by the time I got done with that, then I uh, started helping in, pitching in on the DeLorean um, and was sort of responsible for, I, I just remember cutting a lot of skids and um, suspension bangs and bounces. And I think Bob and um, Harry Miller and John Larson focused uh, a lot on the engine sounds and whatnot. And I was cutting like all the skids and associated other car sounds and things. Um, and besides the actual little mule, the, the sound of the DeLorean was laced with, with a lot of different wines, like jet wines, um, turb different types of turbine wines. And uh, I remember um, Bob having worked on the original Star Wars in our sound effects library, we had composite sounds of the land speeder and the TIE fighters in Star Wars. So in a couple of uh, those dramatic scenes with the DeLorean flying by, trying to get up to 88 miles an hour, um, there's, if you listen carefully, you'll hear a land speeder by or a TIE fighter by sweetening in, in those areas along with the different turbine wines. So it was a conglomeration of a lot of different fun sounds, just you know, layering as we always do as sound editors and sound designers. It's, it's an amalgamation of a lot of cool different sounds. Very cool, awesome. All right, Sam, I'm gonna see if this one can come back to you. Uh, the clock tower is such an essential location to the story. Uh, how did you go about making the bells on the tower sound so big? Well, part of that was in mixing. I mean, all we could do is cut the basic elements. I was actually thinking that I should talk about the storm and the clock tower because that is something I worked extensively on. There was the lightning, the winds, the sound of the ticking, the sound of the bells, uh, all the various things, the, the lightning, the, the crashes, the uh, electromagnetic pulses through the, the wires on the street. Um, all that stuff was a huge uh, uh, endeavor by more than just myself. There were a number of editors that worked on that, but specifically I worked on winds and the lightning. And I think that uh, Jerry Stanford and a couple others, I, I don't recall actually, to be honest with you, who worked on it, but there were three or four of us. But there were a lot of different winds that we would weave in and out. You know, we wouldn't just cut a track for 300 feet and say, okay, go ahead and mix it. We would roll in and out different levels and types of wind, depending on what you're seeing, when the lightning struck, what the clouds looked like, you know, basically the storm sort of roiled up the wind storm and the lightning and it came to a crescendo. I can't really speak to like how many bells were cut. You know, it's hard to mix things of that kind of tonal nature. You know, if you've ever tried to cut a siren in a car chase, it's extremely hard in, in 35 millimeter sound to find a place where it can cross over and not bip or beep or cl sound clipped. Often we just cut two overlapping pieces and one would fade into the other. But cutting two bells together, if they didn't, if they weren't, there's no way to know cutting on a moviola what's going to work well together. So often you cut a, a few things that you think are creatively, you know, uh, uh, I think Scott mentioned or somebody mentioned uh, low range, mid range, and high range. You know, you pick things that that peak out at different free range frequencies so that it's all covered and the mixer will, you know, gently or not so gently combine those, use them. And there were, um, you know, I think one of the more interesting things are the clock ticks, you know, with the, the with the reverb and all that that was added in, of course, on the mixing stage. Um, all you can do is you, we're baking a cake, we supply the ingredients and you put it in the oven, the mix stage, and it comes out, voila, you know, but 
there has to be, you know, starting with the supervisor who selects the original sound effects and then the editor who puts it together and visualizes or audioizes what he thinks will work one piece at a time. Because remember, it's 35 millimeter and old sound moviola. And then, as I said much earlier, you hang it on a pin and you go to the next sound effect. You mark it on the sound effect, you mark it on the dupe, and later it gets built together. All these things in mass go to the stage and you hear it all together for the first time. So I can't be really ex explicit about what was used other than I worked on it. Like Scott said, 37 years ago, even singing it again is like tremendous sounds, you know, but by today's standard, you know, it would probably be a little, if not majorly different, you know, in terms of, I don't know, this, the, the, the breadth and width of it, you know, um, the, today's audience is much more uh, uh, um, sound um, interested, you know, there are more audiophiles than ever, you know, like home theaters and things like that. But, it, you know, the movie stands the test of time because it was so creative and out of the box, you know, in terms of all the hijinks and the idea behind, behind going back to the future and <clears throat> anyways uh i digress um that's about all i can give you on that that's hey, perfect I'll, I'll, Miguel, let me jump in for a second too and just mention something to sam you know we cut to the close-up of the clock uh minute moving right you know uh chuck asked us to do something that in the foley stage so we took uh a big breaker box you know for like you know 240 whatever the heck it is nice and, a circuit and, breaker or a uh, a, a big big you know big box you know and just threw that thing um uh, and we put it on top of the we called the uh, uh well uh, this wood floor which would act as a resonator to make it sound a little bigger and lower and then uh tim took it and flew it to a quarter inch machine and slowed it down and put it back in so that was our contribution on that just i did not know that see i wasn't there on the final mix so <laughs> yeah, yeah anyway <laughs> Yeah, that's great, Jeff. Thanks. That's, that's a nice Foley touch. This That whole clock tower scene with uh, all of the elements Sam has just mentioned, there was a lot of detail in there from everyone, I feel. Uh, John, do you have anything other in, in that sequence or that scene specifically you want to talk about with Foley? Well, we knew that it was going to be really noisy. You know, like the wind machine in the production, you know, it was pretty crazy if I recall correctly. So, you know, anything had to be what we call OTT. You know, Foley land, you know, Ellen and I working, we would say, okay, is this natural? And so it sounds just right. Or if it's over the top, OTT. So, <laughs> so when, uh, when Doc pulls it, excuse me, pulls the cable and realizes it's stuck, you know, we took a huge piece of conduit and, and I can't remember if Ellen did it, she might have, and took a, you know, big piece of metal, and, you know, and so we, we just tried to do things that were going to really get, again, be over the top. So they play through. Um, and, you know, the cracking of the, of the, I think the lightning hit the tree, part of the tree and it cracked. So we take a, oh, <laughs> uh, from uh, wood shingles and we put them really close to the mic in a certain way and pull them back together. Like, you know, we'd see it one, two, three, go. And those would be really big. And again, they might be flown out to the quarter inch machine, slow down, whatever. Again, that was all, uh, you know, uh, the, the wonderment of uh, Tim Sadler. So uh, anything else, Ellen, you can think of there? I was really particularly interested when I listened back the other night to the wobbling sound of the cables, because that was a real challenge to get something that was over the top, that wow. was going to be big enough and, you know, increase the drama of what was going on. And I thought I heard one of those Correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought we had one of those plastic toys with the coiling uh, metal. Uh, yeah, thing space, foam. space foam. A space foam. Yep. I, thought, I thought I heard that, and maybe I'm wrong, but did we? Do you remember? We had we that was that was we had something like that, but it was one element. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, when I call space foam, there's also some musical instruments too that have that same type of thing. I forget what those are called though. So, but that, that was definitely a part of it. Um, yeah, that, that's a good, good call. You know? Yeah, it could have been a, a musical instrument. I don't know, but it yeah. was built like a, a toy, like a sound yeah. toy. Yeah, it, it had like a, uh, oh, I don't know, like a two foot uh, uh, yeah. piece of metal that's, you know, coiled. 
uh, like slinky like, but much smaller in, in the end of a, end of a, oh, like a, a, co a cup, coffee cup size. And it was, but it was, it was drum like, if you will. So you could stroke it and <laughs> do a certain thing. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mentioned Miguel much earlier about combining effects, you know, and I, I wanted to mention uh, like during the lightning strikes, of course, we're using recorded lightning strikes, but I, I love the idea of a sound editor that, you know, the creativity that, you know, a tree falls. And I always like to add a wave crash with the tree fall because it adds an element of low end and much larger and wider frequency than just the middle to high end of the branches cracking and the wave crash on the beach is at the same time the tree hits the ground, right? With an explosion at the bottom, a low end explosion, you know, cannon fire. And that's what we did or I did was with the lightning is we would add mortar shots or cannon, depending on how, how big the low end you wanted. And even usually not rifle shots, but gunshots or, uh, you know, uh, things that had high impact just for the start of the lightning crack, you know? So that stuff goes on all the time. Obviously all sound editors understand that, you know, combined with whatever we get from the Foley stage, whatever we're handed and whatever we can come up with, you know, that's what adds to the, sound experience the soundscape right very cool glenn what about from your department with the adr that, that's a very big scene lots of wind machines and practical effects going on on the set how did you guys deal with that well again lots <laughs> lots of eight lots of adr for that for sure uh mo most of that production was um got a uh, guide material but you know it's it, it goes without saying it's just adr and cutting it and making sure it it didn't over mod and it's in sync and has a lot of drama to it you know i wish i could be more dramatic about it but it was it was straight ahead fair enough Perfect. thank you <laughs> Uh, in 1955, there are period cars all over town. Did you manage to have a chance to record uh, these cars as well as the DeLorean for this film, which we've talked about a little bit? Um, I think uh, Chuck's crew covered all of the the normal uh, cars and things. And I think Chuck had a, a pretty good library of some 50s cars. I don't think I don't think that there were specific recordings for Back to the Future. I could be wrong, but I just remember that the time frame being so short, um, both Chuck and Bob had great sound effects libraries. And, um, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe that um, all those 50s cars were culled from Chuck's library. I'm pretty sure that's correct, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. I approve. That's correct. Crowds, cars. Uh, ambiences, all that stuff. All that wasn't specialized, uh, you know, by the uh, DeLorean crew, you know, Chuck and all the editors on our crew. Uh, it's not like we were two separate crew. Actually, we edited in two separate facilities. Yeah. Chuck yeah. and Bob were about two and a half miles away on Magnolia Boulevard, and we were on, on Hollywood Way near Magnolia. And um, yeah, Chuck had an immense library. He had a great library all 35 and he was one of the if i remember correctly when it started turning towards putting it on dad or vhs or other media other than 35 he said yeah not for me i mean he'd been doing it for 35 40 years so yeah actually interestingly enough um during that period where dats came up our transfer person Tak ogawa um right from japan and you know sony just started making uh these dat recorders and so we sent him over there, gave him our money. We all wanted to buy a, a DAT recorder. Um, and so he came back from his uh, trip from Japan. And yeah, Blue Light was actually the first library that was transferred to DATs to make access to these sounds less cumbersome than having to mount every single uh, mag stripe sound effect together to be transferred to, to mag. Wow. Um, it was a pretty arduous process, but it was really cool. I remember um, mixing on a film after uh, the library had been transferred to DAT. And I walked in the dub stage with the, the little DAT tape, which is like three, three inches wide. And I said, here, like, I forget how many sound effects I had on that one little DAT tape.
but everyone was like, whoa, what is that? <laughs> it's like crazy. But um, no, it changed things a lot. Being able to record to that uh, digitally um, was a huge advance. And then obviously having your whole voluminous sound effects library um, transferred to DAT and being able to carry your library around in a big briefcase basically um, ultimately is, is yep. pretty, pretty trick. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Scott, I think this will be a question for you again with the DeLorean. Uh, at the very end, when Marty and Jennifer join Doc in the DeLorean, it surprises us by lifting off the ground and begins flying. What went into the flying sounds of the DeLorean in this scene? You know, I think it, it, as cool as it sounds, it was, I think, pretty much just a culmination of some various um, jet sounds. Um, some some whooshes as it uh, rose up into the air, there were some uh, whooshes and some uh, jet propulsive sounds and surges uh, along with the jet winds and turbine winds and whatnot. And it was a pretty brief event. I mean, it basically starts up, it rises in the air and it flies away. So it was a pretty, pretty brief event there. Awesome. Uh, just looking at the clock, we are nearing 5.30. I wanted to put it to the you as a group and see, uh, are there any uh, ex parts of the film or processes in the film we haven't mentioned that you felt uh, something really exciting happened or uh, was it a really interesting experience to have? I'd say go to the questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, the only thing that was fun that I can remember just as far as being a fun story is I just remember at that time of the year in uh, June, yeah, it was like June, it was hotter than Hades. And I remember coincidentally the air conditioning at Blue Light Sound where we were editing went out. And oh, uh, if you can only imagine, and I'm not exaggerating, we literally, we were editing in our underwear. It was like, we we're all so hot. We just took off our <laughs> jeans and we're just editing with that but that's just an aside so anyway how often does that happen editing in your underwear. every day right behind me there you go yeah, exactly. <laughs> ever since ever since covid it's a, it's not such a big thing but right 1985 not so much wow <laughs> I, i'll i'll share a personal story about back to the future uh my wife but then my girlfriend we were looking for a place to move into and we're looking all over, couldn't find a place. All of a sudden, one popped up, but the guy said, oh, we need to clean it up because the, you know, the, the occupant just moved out. And I went, we'll take it. We'll take it. So we move in, and then all of a sudden, that person's mail keeps showing up, stacks and stacks. And it wasn't until I, this one envelope was very thick, and it was from a studio. And I went, oh, this is important. So I called that person's agent. And I said, I have all this mail. Where can I drop it off? So I go and drop it off. And the next thing I know, I get a phone call and it's Michael J. Fox. They oh, moved wow. him out of his apartment and put him in this transit uh, um, condo because he was still doing family ties and back to the future. So I moved in his apartment and still was getting <laughs> in his mail. So I was coming to the set sometimes and saying michael mail call and i would be giving him his his, his mail That's so funny. for me that was kind of fun because i had no idea that i was going to be working on that film at the time oh that's amazing i love stories like that synchronicity yeah you know and, a, are you going to go to questions there's one in there for the foley people I was going to say to, I see some questions have been coming in. Uh, those of you that have been holding off, feel free to start adding questions in uh, to the chat now, and we will get to as many of them as we can. The Foley people. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like we're from another planet. <laughs> oh, no. Well, he is from another planet today. I'm sorry for, for our Foley friends. You know, when I started, John, which was before you started, we walked our own Foley. I know that. Yeah. My dad was a sound editor and uh, he knew Jack Foley at Universal Studios. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, all the sound editors, like Fred Brown, uh, supervisor that Sam, you and I both worked with on Convoy. 
Yeah. He oh was, my God. He was, he was a great Foley artist. And that's Bob Rutledge was fabulous. Ross Brown, Ross yeah, Taylor, yeah. Ross Taylor, yeah. Kitty Malone. Yeah. Kitty yeah, lives up the street from me. I see her all the time at Gelson's. She's like 80 something. All right, said hello, please. Still very much alive. I will. I will. Love Kitty. Yeah, the, uh, and Bob and his sister, not so much, but Bob was a great Foley walker. He was a yeah. great Foley house. Bob Rutledge. I mean, this pre you know, was uh, prior to uh, John becoming indoctrinated at Go, Go Million Sound. Was that your first place you worked, John? Well, two things. Or was it uh, quality sound? Well, that's that's another story altogether. Uh, yeah, uh, Go Million <laughs> was kind of the first thing, but actually there's something before that, but I will say this and I'll go jump back to Miguel with the questions. Yeah, Bob and I did a uh, uh, Empire Strikes Back uh, along with Gary and some other people. And uh, Bob was excellent. He really was. Uh, besides being a great sound editor, he was a really good Foley artist and a, and a good guy. So and he's, he's missed. But anyway, I'm sorry, Miguel, go ahead. No problem at all. Uh, I have a question here. How was the sound effect of the plutonium being sucked into the time machine created? Ah. Wow. That's easy. Is it a vacuum tube? I, I, can I can tell you all the elements used for that. Go, um, go for it. You, uh, we had an air supply on the Foley stage. And so uh, I shot through a tube into a glass, some air, right? Then we used a little liquid. Then we used a uh, crystal glass tink when it hit in the bottom. And uh, one other thing, which is kind of murky, I'd have to have the picture in front of me to know, but uh, that's pretty much how we did that. Because again, Foley for Ellen and myself, you know, it's just, don't be afraid to experiment. You know, there are, there are no, there, there are no wrong things to do. It's just like, well, that's not quite what we want. And of course with Chuck, you know, saying, let's give it a little more heel toe or let's do this, let's do that. You know, him being the actor, he could, you know, help direct us and which was really wonderful. So I, Ellen, I think that got that one, right? Yeah, no, it was a great sound. I admired it. I just watching back all this stuff. It's sort of been really, really fun. Yeah. It was cool. nice to have the time to be able to experiment, to go through things and do the trial and error of discovering what would work or what wouldn't, because I don't always have that luxury of the time to just be creative. And then, yeah. There you go, Miguel. I think, John, you, I, I think, if, I don't know, I, I'm pretty sure Chuck used our the opening scene is his sizzle reel for the Bake Off. That's correct. And that was almost all Foley, which I thought was kind of cool. There was, there was some in there, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people probably would not know what the Bake Off was. That's true. Are we bringing I myself it back? just learned about it. What? Yeah. Sounded like a good time. I heard a rumor it was coming back, Sam. Is that true? I don't know. The uh, makeup artist and one other branch still uses it. We stopped yep. using it for a while ago. I think it was just used this past season, actually. For I, I don't know the details of it. I think it was. Um, it might be yeah, right. it was. It was. I was there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very different. Was Everybody was on Zoom, but it was on the big screen in the theater. Right. It's, yeah. it's very long to explain, but the Bake Off is how for years the sound editing uh, awards were determined whether or not the Oscars would present sound editing. They invited, was it seven films to show a 10 minute sizzle reel of different sound effects. Some were artfully put together, some were just log jams of uh, all the heavy uh, you know, sound effect moments in the film. Is it seven to 10 or is it 10 minute reel, right? Was it 10 awesome. minute, 10 10 minute, minute reel? reel of any sequence you wanted and uh, everybody in the sound branch was invited and you would vote on these. And if three films got a certain average, three or more, they would have the sound award that year. And if three films didn't make the average, uh, a mean average, I don't remember what the number was, then there would be no award. Except so. for the fact that if there was the governors decided that one picture was really uh, above and beyond, they would grant a special Sound That's effect. Correct. That's and correct. the river was given that to K. Rose. Yes, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Right. I've so, got another question here. Uh, how did each of you get started in motion picture sound? 
Nepotism. <laughs> Nepotism. For you, yeah. not for all of us. I know. That, that would take another whole show to talk about. <laughs> a little, little bit of nepotism. And uh, once the doors open, um, you've got to make it happen to keep That's your right. career alive. That's right. Uh, I would... But I started personally, I started as a driver because working on film, um, you know, it's so cumbersome lugging uh, metal reels full of mag stripe, a lot of heavy boxes. So I started as a driver personally, and it was a great um, intro to the business because in driving to the different studios and dropping film off and receiving uh, materials to take back to Blue Light Sound, I got to meet all the different people at all these different facilities. And uh, that was huge, just as far as connecting and, and meeting a wide variety of people. Um, so that, that was my start as a driver. Um, I started because I was third generation sound or uh, motion picture. My grandfather and my father were both in the business. Um, and I, my first job as an assistant or apprentice on They Shoot or The Secret of Santa Victoria in 1968. And uh, most of you probably never heard of that film. And, uh, and I think you're absolutely right, Scott. You can get in, but if you're low level talent or willingness to achieve, then you don't make it very far. Nobody hires you. But if you have the aspiration to be good at it you enjoy it and you're brought along by mentors that care about you you can do great things and have a great career and uh, I, think, I I just want to really add I know a lot of people that networked out of film school that's where they met people that went on to have careers and they tag you know dovetailed in with them or were inspired to go into sound or picture or directing or photography or whatever sorry Glenn no, no, it's okay, because I'm going to embarrass you now. Okay, please. A lot of us have to step back and realize the, the last name Crutcher is very important to the MPSC. Because it's Sam's dad who made this all happen in their kitchen. And mom. It, and mom. Et, um, Ethel. Matter of fact, that's where our um, foundation uh is it foundation? Scholarship and foundation. Scholarship and foundation. Uh, they really championed, and they were the frontiers for the motion picture sound editors over the years. And for me personally, they, Sam's dad, Norval, was very, very good to me. And Norval introduced me to Larry Singer, which then allowed me to work on Back to the Future. Both Sam and Norval hired me to work on Karate Kid. And from there, I was able to uh, move on and, and work with Larry Singer. And also, one of my first jobs, not very glamorous, but now it is, is when, <laughs> when John Resch moved into Taj, it was an old recording studio, and the stage was on the second floor. And they had built an, a pit that was, what, two stories high of dirt? Correct. And I'm one of the many millions that stood there and shoveled dirt into that two-story <laughs> hole. <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell anybody how many bodies you put in there, Glenn. So when you talk about learning the craft from the ground up, hello. <laughs> that, but I'm, I'm also very appreciative to, to uh, John. And, and, I, and to this day, there are fully artists. They're not fully guys. They're not walkers as they have been known to be but um i've learned a lot from john moving up but then i learned a lot i learned a lot from bob rutledge as well and one of the cl classic things i learned from bob rutledge you can make anything sound like something else it's the craft and the art of using your talent and understanding the dynamics of that material you're working with and uh it definitely is a, is a is a testament to not having limitations on your creativity. Uh, yeah, Bob was amazing. You know, now nowadays with uh, Pro Tools and whatnot, a lot of you know sizable part of the job is technical. But back then, there was no technical part of it involved at all as being a sound editor. Um, and yeah, Bob was just wildly creative, and I think that's part of the reason why Chuck felt so confident. Um, turning over the DeLorean and 
um, passing through the time barrier. I think, you know, he just said, you know, it was, it was a perfect fit to have Bob um, cover those elements. And, and personally, my career, I, I owe everything to Bob Rutledge. Um, I learned everything from the ground up from Bob and he was fabulously generous guy um, in, in many more ways than one. He always had open arms to help anyone as Glenn mentioned. Um, he was super, super supportive and, uh, and uh, just gracious all the way through. So props to Bob. And yeah. don't, don't forget funny. <clears throat> I said, don't forget funny. Sorry, Ellen. Oh yeah. It's okay. I just uh, remember remembering him too. I worked with him on table for five and just a lot of stuff. And we just got along so great. And back then it was really hard for a young you know, girl in a man's world to feel comfortable. I always had like, someone was always coming on to me and I, I just wanted to be seen and known as a good Foley artist. Um, and you are. But he was cool. He, Bob wasn't, he never went there with me. And I always appreciated that and liked working with him because of that. But um, I, as far as me, my start, I was um, a dance major and music minor at UCLA. So I had all this classical training as a musician. And oh, wanted, I wanted to be like the female Ian Anderson, um, playing flute on one leg and whatever. But I was humbled over time and um, was just doing, you know, choreographing stage plays uh, for a local theater. And one night, uh, Kim Fowler, who I'm sure you remember, John. And I remember Sam, her. You probably, yeah. So her and I became friends. Uh, Finian's Rainbow was the play and she came in as an understudy. And I just was like, I'm so tired of being a poor dancer. She says, well, come and do this thing with me. Dancers are really good at it. You have an eye for memorizing choreography and timing and rhythm. And you just set the coffee cup down at the same time the actor does. And uh, I was like, they're gonna pay me how much? I can do that, I, I'll, I'll do it. And turns out um, the Burbank editorial where she had introduced me to, they were doing this film, Skate Town USA. Our projectionist was had a roller skate, can you come in? And at the time it was Pat Somerset and Jeff Bushelman. And they were wearing Coke spoons and, you know, vodka tonics and cocaine were their lunches. They didn't want to do Foley. They were doing it, little paper movement here, some footsteps, whatever, but they had no interest. So they were very eager to just pawn it off. And Dan, and then it was just like, you know, all that jazz, you know, um, chapter two, Kramer versus Kramer, Dune, the very first Dune. So I just, was very lucky with timing and got in and basically we just trained ourselves and that, you know, I didn't have to sweep floors or I didn't plan on this as an occupation, but as it turned out, I guess the universe decided this is what you're gonna do. <laughs> so I think it's interesting. Some people plan what they're gonna do and uh, I never did, I just got lucky. But having said all that, dance and music was the perfect background, the perfect training, because there, there was no formal training, right? We just did it. We pioneered the sounds that everybody's using today. And I think they kind of take it for granted sometimes. But um, yeah, that was, that's basically my story. John? Well Back to you in the studio. <laughs> well, the weather is going to be sunny. Um, <laughs> no, mine, I just, I just got lucky, honestly. And I can thank uh, Gordon Ecker and Chuck Campbell. Uh, and then, of course, you, Hilda Hodges, Joan Rowan, some other people. So I don't know really when to dwell on that right now, but it's been a wonderful ride, that's for sure. So awesome. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to finish it up with the last question here. Uh, and it's just about Robert Zemeckis's involvement with the sound editorial design process. How involved was he before getting to the final mix stage? It's hard to know because none of us, I'm assuming none of us did, went to the pre-production or pre uh, the post-production meetings with him. 
this also answers the other question, how was it orchestrated? Who was the sound designer that was earlier in the chat? You know, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale delivered their vision to Chuck Campbell, and he's been doing this for a number of years. He will take that vision with his wherewithal understanding, the ability to orchestrate all his editors into a formidable force of editorial knowledge and abilities, uh, you know, and he dis disperses his insight and what he got from Robert Zemeckis to Bob Rutledge and his crew and to our crew. So who is the overall designer? Well, it's Bob Zemeckis, but it's left to Chuck Campbell to bring to him what he articulates verbally in a world of sound. So he can only think that he understands what he wants to hear. And this is very typical, I think, of a lot of directors I've spoken with or worked for or happen to be lucky enough to supervise a project for. They articulate what they think it might sound like or how it should be. And you deliver that as close as you can, but also you add to or um, argument with what you think works not best, but better or not better, but along with perhaps replacing it, perhaps only augmenting, augmenting or supplementing. So it's a trickle down thing, you know, from Zemeckis to Chuck Campbell to Bob Rutledge to the rest of the editors. This is what we want. Let's see where we go with it. And then it goes all goes to the stage in a basket, all the all the um, the uh, the cake mix, so to speak, where we're going to bake the cake on the stage. And then they decide together, you know, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. I don't know if Bob was involved in the final dub or not, actually. But Robert Zemeckis is on the stage for the final mixes. Chuck is giving him what his best effort is behind him. All of us are supporting him with that best effort. So I think it's a trickle down and then a reboot up or a push forward to the stage, so to speak. And it gets delivered in a way that is acceptable and uncompromising because a lot of energy and time and creativity over Chuck's career had led him to the place where he could command a crew or lead a crew of Foley artists, sound editors, ADR people, et cetera, to culminate in the final mix. Yeah, I, I think um, with this film being such a short turnaround, I th think, you know, the trust that um, Bob Zemeckis had with Chuck uh, weighed huge. And, you know, nowadays, um, you know, through the editorial process, you can do crash downs of sounds to send to the director and film editor to audition and listen to. But in that process, it was go. I mean, they just were hoping we could get done let alone being critical. So, I mean, I think really Bob Zemeckis was only hearing sounds on the dub stage at the final mix stage. Um, I, I actually spoke with uh, Bruce Richardson briefly um, this week and uh, he relayed a funny story that he remembered uh, saying that Apparently, Bob Zemeckis, of all the sounds in the film to, to pick on, I think it was like some offstage dog bark or some, some innocuous sound effect. And he said to Chuck, I don't really care for that dog bark. And I forget if it was a dog bark, but I'll just say for now, I don't really care for that, that particular dog bark. Can't you change it to like a German Shepherd? And Chuck's like, you know what? We've got so many bigger fish to fry, Bob. That, that dog's staying in the movie. <laughs> and so it's like, we got to go get this thing done. If, if that's your biggest worry is the offstage dog bark, we're doing damn well. So and I thought that was a funny story to hear. All right. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, Scott, Sam, Glenn, John, Ellen. Thank you for all of your insights and for you, sharing uh, with us. I'm sorry, but somebody asked you if you could screen share that variety ad before we go, because we talked about doing it. Cool. John, did, didn't you have more to share? Me? Uh, yes. well, Miguel is now the time? Yes, John, you can go for it. All right, well, first and foremost, of course, thank you to Eric and then you, Miguel, for picking up because uh, Eric had a wonderful thing happen. So, um, which I won't mention because um, it's a very personal thing, but a wonderful thing. And of course, Scott, Sammy, my heart soars like a hawk, Glenn, and of course, Ellen, my partner. Um, I'm gonna give an unabashed advertisement now because uh, I'll be retiring next year. So I'm gonna be starting a new chapter where I, along with my partners, Charles Kohlmeyer and Chris Hanslick, have created Audible Bandwidth Productions and that will be my main focus. We will create film and television shows, offer fully stage consulting, design, and education. And through my agent, 
Molly Plotkin and Molly Plotkin Productions and can be engaged for team building events and speaking engagements for any appropriate venue anywhere in the world. So look for more information later this year. And I'm only doing that because um, I guess I'm not retiring, I'm just going to another chapter, but uh, it's- uh, Congratulations, John. Thank I thought you. that's amazing. You've been a wonderful friend for many years. I treasure all the moments that we work together and have just bumped elbows, brushed shoulders, et cetera, in the industry. You've been a true friend. Indeed, Absolutely. as you all have to me, for sure. This has been great. We should do it more often. Thanks, yeah. Miguel, for hosting. Scott, Glenn, great. Ellen, great to see you all. Love you guys. Thank you, guys. I was... appreciate it. Hey, John. You're yes, going to leave some very large gaffer tape shoes to fill. Uh, they'll be well taken care of at Skywalker, I can tell you that. Thanks, everybody in the chat for all your comments. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. And Miguel, thank you for sure. Yeah, thanks, Miguel. Appreciate and it. And great, yeah, Scott. Great chatting with all of you. Hey, hey Eric, look at uh, Hi, Dad. You have anything to announce, Eric? Uh, well, not, nothing for, for me, but Miguel, thank you so much for, for hosting such a great event. Thank you all for, for coming and um, for all your stories. And I just want to add one thing. Um, for anyone out there interested in learning more about Scott Hecker, uh, there will be a, an article coming in the next issue of MPSC Wavelength. It'll be the cover article. Nice. Very excited for you all to learn more about Scott and his career. That was fun to put together. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful to, to hear all your stories. I can't wait for everyone else to, to hear them as well, outside of just this project. But really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. And see everyone at the next MBSC Sound Advice event. Got it. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Bye, everybody.